The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn in the temple. Was there more than one veil? If so, which veil was torn, and how was it torn? Welcome, friends, to Grace in Focus, the broadcast and podcast ministry of the Grace Evangelical Society. Stay tuned for this question and answer episode, and then find out more about us at our website, faithalone.org. Now with today's program content, here are Bob Wilkin and Ken Yates. This is Ken Yates, and I'm here with uh, Bob Wilkin in hot Dallas, Texas. Yo! Yeah, really hot here. Bob earlier went on a walk, and he came back crying about how hot it is outside. It was like 93, 95 degrees, and uh, it was... Hot, hot, hot. Like uh, Good Morning Vietnam, right? Yeah. When, he does, when he does the weather there. I'm Robin give Williams. You the weather report. <laughs> what is it? Hot, hot. <laughs> That's the way it is in Dallas, Texas. It is. Well, we got a question here uh, from Adam Bob. and uh, His it, name is Adam Bob? His name is just Adam, and you're Bob. <laughs> I'm Bob. You're, you're Bob. And he is asking about a blog that I did uh, back in June that deals with uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 38. And I just want to read the verse. It's a verse that most students of the New Testament are aware of. It talks about when Jesus dies. Uh, Jesus dies in Mark fifteen thirty-seven, And it says in verse 38 that when he breathed his last... The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And uh, what my blog was about was growing up, I'd all, I had always heard, in fact, I remember even hearing a sermon on this in seminary, that the veil there is referring to the same veil that the author of Hebrews talks about, which is that there was a veil right before the Holy of Holies. And this veil represented, the author of Hebrews talks about it, that the way into the Holy of Holies was not open until the death of Christ. Right. And so I think we could say that the majority of evangelicals would say, and they may very well be right, that that's what Mark is referring to when he says that Jesus died and the veil of the temple was torn in two, and that this would represent that when Jesus died, we now have access to God. That to the, ho- the very presence of the Holy of Holies. Right. And the Holy of Holies represented the presence of God. Because Jesus is our mediator, therefore he's opened the way to the very presence of God, like in Hebrews 4. Right. That we may boldly approach the throne of grace. Right. And so that would be a perfectly legitimate way to understand this. And again, that's what I was always taught. And again, that very may. But you have a, well, let me mention one other thing, which I think works with your view as well. And that is Mark makes the odd point that it's from top to bottom. Why not just say it was torn? Why say from top to bottom? Well, most commentators say that that's because... The top represents God, and the bottom represents man. And so God has taken the initiative to open the way to his presence. Exactly. And by the way, it's interesting. I just looked at the Greek text. Guess what the word is for top? Anothen. The same word used in John 3. Born from above. You must be born again, or you must be born from above. Zane Hodges said it should have been translated in John 3. You must be born again from above. Both are true. And here it's used from above, from the top to the bottom. So we would say in English, top to bottom, but with the Greek, it's from above to the bottom. To the bottom. And, and, And when you hear people talk about this particular passage, taking the typical evangelical and I would say free grace, I, I would say, right. I would probably say most free grace guys would say this as well, that I remember, I don't remember who it was. It was like the hand of God because this, uh, this curtain was huge, was gigantic. I can't remember the yeah. dimensions, but I've heard it may have been as, as, as high as a 75 feet high, right. you know, just this gigantic curtain and it was thick. 
I'd, I'd heard that it was like 18 inches thick, and I'd even heard that it took like 300 men if it was ever to be moved. So this is a gigantic curtain. It's not like a little thing that you see in your house. Right. <laughs> it's not a shower curtain. And it's like the hand of God took this invisible giant scissors and cut it, opening the way into his presence. Now, would, do you hold a slightly different view that this wasn't the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies, but it's a different veil in the temple? Yes. Which, which years later, we're told, for example, Josephus. Josephus says that there were two veils in the temple. One, now, who's Josephus? Josephus was a, a Jewish historian that lived during the first century. He was a military uh, leader during the war with the Romans. As I recall, he kind of was a traitor to the Jewish people. You know, he was fighting against the Romans, but then he became friend with the Romans. And anyway, he wrote a history during this time. Late first century. Right. And he lived through these. He was, you know, he lived in, in the last part of the first century there. So he was there during a lot of this. And he said that there were there was another veil. And so the question is, which veil is it in Mark fifteen thirty eight that is torn? And what's the other veil, according to Josephus? Where was it? It was on the outside as you came into the temple. So it would be something you pass through to get into the temple itself? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if he goes into that much detail or not. But the inner veil, which is normally taken, was one that no one saw. Except right. for the priests. Right. Except for the well, priests. And especially the high priest, because only the high priest could go through that veil, right? Right. So this was, if it's the inner veil, it is a veil that no one saw rip. Right. Tore. Right. You know, unless there was a priest hanging in the holy place, not the right. holy of holies, but the holy place. Now, right. There may have been a few priests, you know, standing around who would have seen it. But the idea that it was an outer veil would be... People saw it, yeah, and they, it was a sign. And right. what was the sign? Yeah, what would the different? Wouldn't it be the same basic message? The no. way that God is open? No, it would be completely different. It would be judgment, and I'm not the only one who holds who ah. brought, judgment on the nation. So God would be saying, top to bottom. I'm introducing judgment upon my people because of the rejection of the one that just died, the Messiah, yeah. the one who just died, the one that you killed. So Je instead of it being a uh, kind of a uh, invitation to come to God, it would be more a warning that unless the nation accepts the reoffer of the kingdom, which would occur early in the book of Acts, well, then they were going to be destroyed by Rome. Exactly. Well, it, not even in Acts, in Mark 1. In Mark 1, how does the book begin? With the offer of the kingdom. Here's right. the offer of the kingdom. John the Baptist, you need to repent. Well, what happens if you don't repent? What if the nation doesn't repent? Yeah. Judgment is going to fall upon the nation. And so that's the way the book ends. So with it, the temple being, the veil being torn... It could be a warning about this judgment that had already been spoken of. Which Jesus speaks about in Mark 13 with the Olivet Discourse, that this temple is going to be destroyed. When the disciples say, hey, look at all these beautiful buildings. And he goes, hey, you see all these beautiful buildings? Not one of them is going to be left. And so this is a statement of, in other words, it's it's a inclusio, a sandwich with the book. It. The offer of the kingdom is offered in the beginning, and this is the way the book ends. Well, it's interesting in uh, Mark 1, I guess it's 14, 15, and 16, it's the good news of the kingdom. Right. Some people call it the gospel of the kingdom. Right. And some people have been confused to think the gospel of the kingdom is the way in which people were born again prior to the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. This had nothing to do with being born again. This was the good news. The kingdom had drawn near, right? Right. And now what's going to happen that this this generation of Jews has rejected it. And judgment. So judgment is coming upon you. And uh, let me just add on that, that when Jesus is on the cross, the Gospels tell us that darkness fell upon. Well, what does that darkness represent? Well... There are debates about that, you know, that God turns his back because he sees all the sin of the world. 
placed upon his son, or is that darkness a sign of judgment that's coming upon the nation wow. as well? And so I I don't know. You know, these this veil here, I, I just want to our listeners to be challenged by this. You, the, the common way of understanding this, and by the way, Adam, Adam, when he asked the question here, he, he asked about this, and he basically says, I understand that the veil is talking about Hebrews, Jesus' flesh, that it is a symbol of that when Jesus died, his flesh, what would we say? Was torn for us. Was yeah. torn or for us. broken. Re- yeah. And, you know, we take the bread, which was broken for you. My right. body was broken. And so some people could take it that way. Right. And that this is what the veil represents, that when the veil was split— that was Jesus' flesh being split. But, but Adam thinks that the veil really was split, at least yes. one of them. Oh, yeah, he believes it. And But he, he's taking, he says, I always thought that that the, uh, the Dorn veil was the typical way. And he asked, do I deny that? Let me just say, no, I think if the veil here in Mark 1538 is the outer veil, the other thing is still true. The author of Hebrews says that with the death of Christ, we have access into God the Father. That's true. That's not the question. The question is, what does Mark intend to mean by this veil splitting in Mark 15? I got you. So right. something could be true, but it's not necessarily taught in every passage. Exactly. And so I just want to let Adam know, no, I believe what the author of Hebrews says, that when Christ died... We have bold access into the presence of the Father. But Mark, what is it? 1538. 1538 doesn't necessarily endorse that. Right. I would say that if I had to bet $5, if I had to bet $5 and you put a gun to my head, I would say, I think that this is the outer veil. Just in the context of Mark. In the context of Mark, the darkness, the offer of the kingdom... I think this is a sign of the judgment, that judgment is falling upon this house. That's how, that's, that would be my view. Yeah. So I think both are true. Yeah. 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 But not necessarily both being taught in this path. One exactly. or the other is being taught here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so the listener has his, has his choice or her choice too, <laughs> to All figure right. out what the torn veil in Mark 1538 means. All right. Well, y'all think about it and check out Ken's blog at faithalone.org. Right. And in the meantime, keep Keep grace grace in focus. focus. Did you miss an episode of Grace in Focus that you really wanted to hear? Just come to faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. We have all our past episodes right there on the site. In addition, we have all kinds of free resources available for you. It's all designed to help you mature and grow in your understanding of Scripture. So come visit us at faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. On this program, we keep our requests for financial partners to a minimum. But if you are interested in becoming a financial partner with Grace in Focus, you can find out how to do that at faithalone.org. Our team is really great about answering questions, comments, and feedback. If you've got some, we hope to hear from you. Let me give you our email address. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. On the next episode, some questions about forgiveness. How does it impact the church? That is next time, and until then, let's keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.